Have you ever noticed how unjust life can be? You do your very best to be a good person, but it seems, in spite of your best efforts to live well, to be decent, you're always getting the short end of the stick. You're the one who seems to have all the problems. Your life is the one coming apart at the seams, and some days you wonder where God went when you needed Him most. You might want to listen to today's program, because in just a moment, I'll show you where God went. You know, if anybody ever had a reason to argue with God, it would probably be an ancient man by the name of Job. You'll find his name attached to a book of the Bible, the book of Job, and the story that book tells is pretty amazing. It's amazing enough that it's been the go-to book for people who suffer for thousands of years. And this is the way the book starts right in the opening passage in verse 1. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Now, honestly, I don't know how many people you can actually describe like that. I mean, really, how many of us could be described as perfectly blameless? I mean, just try running for public office, and your opponent would delight to show you in very graphic terms that you are not blameless. And yet, according to the sacred record, that's what Job was. He was blameless and upright, a godly man who stayed away from evil. So, of course, you'd expect that somebody that good would have an amazing life, right? You'd expect that things went well for him, that God would always smile on his day. Because good people always have enjoyable lives, don't they? And evil people always have terrible lives. Except, you and I both know it doesn't work like that. Good people suffer all the time. And bad people seem to get away with murder. And I mean sometimes literally. It's almost like the universe doesn't care. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. I don't know if you remember that book from some years ago, Harold Kushner's bestseller, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That book sold millions of copies and for a very good reason. The title tells the truth. It demolishes all the fairy tales. Good people suffer, and sometimes bad people don't. And I'm guessing that's probably the reason so many people find the book of Job intriguing. It deals in reality. In spite of the fact that Job was good, he got absolutely hammered by a series of unbelievable disasters. First, he loses all his animals, which in those days was the same as losing your bank account or your business. In essence, Job went broke. So his story really speaks to people who lost their shirt in 2008 or back in the 1981 crash or, if you're old enough, the 1929 crash. The, the point is, Job's story is still relevant, even though it happened thousands of years ago. Then, after he loses his animals, his employees are murdered by two different bands of marauders. So now Job loses all his staff. And if that wasn't bad enough, there's a third disaster. His children are at a party, and the house caves in on them, and every single one of his kids dies. Now, if you ask me, that is not the kind of stuff that should happen to good and godly people. That's the stuff that should happen to people that are evil, right? We want bad people to suffer and good people to do well. And sometimes we want it to be that way so badly that when bad things actually happen to someone, we go looking for reasons they deserve it. We tell ourselves, oh, they must have done something or this wouldn't have happened. It's kind of like that story when Jesus heals a blind man and his disciples assume that his parents must have done something bad because why else would somebody suffer like that? And, and think back to the devastating earthquake that hit Haiti just a few years ago. Within a day, it seems, there were people saying that the Haitians probably had it coming. It must have been their sins that brought that on the island nation. It must have been their association with voodoo. It must have been something, because why else would it happen? Do you remember the huge tsunami that pounded the coastline of Southeast Asia? I mean, the one before Fukushima? Someone suggested 
that one of the massive waves actually looked like the name Allah in Arabic when you looked at it from the sky. And the, the implication was that God was punishing those people for something they did. And after the massive earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan, it didn't take long for stories to start circulating that somehow this was God's way of punishing bad people. They must have done something. I mean, why else would it happen? And that's human nature. We love to think that people who suffer must have done something wrong. And sometimes I actually wonder if we say that to make ourselves feel better about not helping them. Oh, they had it coming, didn't they? Or maybe it's because we want to believe that we must be on high moral ground if these things didn't happen to us. Those people suffered and we didn't, so we must be pretty good. But go back and pay attention to the story of Job. There is a reason this book has captured our imagination for thousands of years, because Job did nothing to bring those tragedies on his family. He was innocent. He lived an exemplary life. In fact, he was so good that God actually brags about him. Just listen to this. This is verse 8 of chapter 1. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Now think about that. How many people do you think God brags about? I mean, can you imagine God saying that about you? How many people does God point to and say, this is a great example of someone who loves me. This is a great example of someone who's doing things right. I mean, how often do you think that happens? Job's life was so spotless that God actually uses him as an example of what's right in our world. But in spite of that, in spite of the highest accolades of heaven, Job still loses it all. He loses his business, his kids eventually even his health. The story tells us that he ends up sitting on the ground covered with sores, and even his wife finally gives up. Why don't you just curse God and die, she says. So, if something could go wrong, it did go wrong. And if anybody ever had a reason to argue with God, it was Job. He was one of those very few people who seems to have a legitimate complaint. And maybe you feel like you have a legitimate complaint. Maybe you've done your very best to live a decent life and it all still falls apart. Maybe in spite of always doing the right thing, even when it costs you something to do it, maybe you're suffering or doing without. Maybe it's tempting to think that good living doesn't pay off. Maybe you're tempted to think that it just isn't worth it. Maybe you're tired and you feel like God hasn't kept up his end of the bargain. You've been good, I mean as good as can be expected, but it doesn't really seem like God is being good. So in just a moment, we're going to start looking for some real answers, and I think you'll be surprised by what we find. But just before that, I want you to hear more about our world-class Discover Bible School because it's really one of the best opportunities you'll ever come across. So hang tight. I'll be right back. Do you feel as if you have more questions than answers in your life? Where is God when people suffer? Can I find real happiness? And is there any hope for our chaotic world? Are you searching for answers to these and other of life's biggest questions? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or pick up the phone and call us at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. 888-456-7933 Study online on our secure website or have the free lessons mailed right to your home. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Now that we've come back from the break, let me ask you kind of a personal question. Have you ever been tempted to argue with God? Now, if you have, you certainly wouldn't be the first. I've been there, I've done it, and so have millions of other people. To you, it seems like you've been keeping your end of the bargain. You've led a decent, productive life. You've treated people the way you want to be treated, and you've kept all the promises you've ever made. But in spite of that, your life comes apart. Now, if you had a chance to discuss the matter with God, I mean, stand right in front of His throne and plead your case, 
I want to ask you this. Would you do it? Would you show up for that appointment? Now, you might want to think carefully about your answer because I'm talking about standing in the presence of Almighty God. You're not muttering and shaking your fist at Him from a safe distance. You're standing in front of Him. And under those circumstances, how confident would you be? How solid do you think your case would seem? Remember, this is God. He can see right through you. You're not going to fool Him. You're not going to be able to spin the facts. You're going to have to deal in hardcore reality. And if you've ever wondered how that meeting might go, you can read about it in the book of Job, because he actually got that opportunity. When his world fell apart, he got to take it up with God. So he had some idea of what that meeting would be like. And maybe that's also part of the fascinating grip this book has on us. We've got this human being, a live, real human being, who gets an audience with God. And how exactly do you have a discussion with God? What do you say? How do you present your case? According to Job chapter 9, he really had to wrestle with that. Here's what it says in verse 14. How then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. Now, honestly, I think if it came right down to it, if I really got an audience with God, I would probably come to the same conclusion. It's tempting to think that I would be brave enough to argue with God, especially if my life is hard. But if it actually happened, would I really be that brave? If I had to look into God's face, knowing He sees all and knows all, how brave would I be? By the sounds of it, Job had some grasp of how that encounter with God might play out. He finds himself at a loss for words, and then he admits something fascinating. Listen to this now, Job 9, verse 20. Though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. So just how well do you know yourself? Well enough to argue with God? Well enough to make the case that you've never done anything wrong? I've sometimes wondered, especially when I'm suffering, why God doesn't just wipe out all the evil on the planet. Why doesn't he just push the reset button and make this world a better place to live? But then I thought about that a little bit more, and I've had to ask a very hard question. If God were to wipe out everything evil, where would I like him to start? And where would I like him to finish? I mean, some targets are obvious, right? You want God to deal with Al-Qaeda. You want God to deal with child pornographers. You want him to get rid of dictators and serial killers. But where do you want him to stop? How much evil do you want him to get rid of? Are you willing for him to come and look at your life? I think I'm blameless, Job said, but I have to admit, I don't know myself. Now that's important. He's admitting that he doesn't have the intellectual capacity to argue with God. He doesn't even have the vocabulary or the experience to have the discussion. And on top of that, he has this sneaking hunch he might not be as blameless as he thinks. And the truth is, None of us really knows ourselves. We might think we're blameless, but in the throne room of God, would you dare to assume it? You see, we've got this big problem. Human beings have been disconnected from God. We have spent so many generations living in a broken world that we actually have lost the ability to look at ourselves objectively. We see evil when it's somebody else, but when it comes to us, we're very good at justifying our moral barometer has been compromised by selfishness. The heart is deceitful above all things, the Bible says, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not one of us can be absolutely certain that we've got a grasp of our own moral condition. Can you be absolutely sure that you know where you stand in relation to God? I mean, if God were trying to eliminate everything wicked, everything, are you confident you'd make the cut? I mean, just think about all the stuff that qualifies as evil. It's just not the bad stuff that makes the 10 o'clock news, not just serial killers and rapists. It's everything in the Ten Commandments. You shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. I mean, let's be honest, how are you doing with the list? And if the list isn't hard enough, Jesus actually raises the bar. He expands on it in Matthew 5, where he says, You have heard it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause 
shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, I hope you're really paying attention because God's standard is very high. The act of murder isn't just killing someone with a gun or a knife. You can actually kill with your anger. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John 3.15 that whoever hates his brother is a murderer. So the moral bar that God sets is very high. And let's be really honest. Do you think you could pass the test? If God started to wipe out all the evil people, I know I'm not going to make the cut. I might think I'm blameless, but evil has become so pervasive, we're so used to it, that we can't really say we know. Our perception is just too corrupt. Our moral bar is just way too low. So, knowing that, do you think you'd really want to take a chance on a face-to-face -face meeting with God? We're going to take a short break, and when I come back, I'll show you that there actually is a way that you can boldly walk into God's throne room in spite of who you are, in spite of what you've done, in spite of all that stuff that drives a wedge between you and a holy God. I'm going to show you how to bridge the massive gap that exists between you and Him, and I don't think you're going to want to miss this. Are you searching for answers to life's most difficult questions? Answers to help you make sense of the things that are happening right now in your life? Answers to the deepest questions in life like, can God really forgive me? Guilt and shame can be terrible burdens to carry and can leave us wondering if God really can love us and accept us. Are you wondering if there really is a chance for true happiness in this life? If there is a secret to living a happy, contented life in a world of uncertainty? Well, if you're searching for answers to these and other of life's most challenging questions, we are here to help. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888-456-7933, for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. You'll find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides as the major themes of the Bible come to life. Begin your journey to discover answers to life's deepest questions and log on today to BibleStudies.com. Today we're talking about how human beings have this tendency to try and find blame when bad things happen to good people. And we're also talking about the fact that sometimes when bad things happen to us, we want to shake our fist at God. And usually we feel like we have the right to be angry because we feel like we lived our lives right. We did everything we could to be honest and decent and hard working. So on the surface, it seems like we have a good reason to argue with God, that Job had a good reason to argue with God. The Bible says he was blameless and upright. And the Bible doesn't say that about very many people. Yet Job loses it all. So you can imagine that Job wants to talk to God, but he isn't actually sure that he has the competency to do it. Now, listen carefully to the way Job describes his own situation, because I think you're going to find this interesting. In Job 9.32, he's talking about God, and he says, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and we should go to court together. And you know, Job kind of has a point there. How do you argue with God? How do you fight a court case against him? You know you're going to lose, because how do you match wits with an almighty creator? So you might want to consider getting a lawyer, someone to help with your case, but where are you going to find that? And now listen to the next thing he says in verse 33. He says, Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Job couldn't think of anybody to help him. He knew he needed a lawyer. He knew he needed representation. But who in the world can be a go-between in negotiations with God? I mean, how do you go to arbitration when one party is never wrong? Who could possibly stand between Job and God and understand both sides of the situation? Who would qualify as a mediator between a human sinner and Almighty God? Who could bridge that gap? For unto us... A child is born, the Bible says. 
Unto us a son is given. Unto who? Unto us, the human race. That's the answer to Job's problem. Jesus is given to us. The second person of the Godhead becomes a human being. Even though we don't deserve it, the Father made a huge sacrifice by sending his Son. And it wasn't a temporary loan. God really gave him to us for all time. There's one member of the Godhead who took on human nature. And even after the resurrection, as he comes back from the dead, he's still in human form. So now, thousands of years later, God the Son is still one of us. He's still a member of our race. He is God, and He is man, and that makes Him the perfect mediator. He's the person Job's looking for, someone who can lay one hand on you and the other hand on God. If you've ever wondered why Jesus became human, this is one good reason. We needed help. We needed a mediator. And because he joined our race, Jesus really understands what it's like to be human. He gets it when bad things happen to good people. Just look at his life. The Bible says he went around doing good. He was a good person. But we told lies about him. We whipped him like a common criminal. He healed the sick and loved people that no one would love. But we called for his blood and we nailed him to a cross. So yes, Jesus gets what it's like to live on this planet. He's been hungry, he's been thirsty, he's been tired, he's been lonely. He's been ridiculed, he's been hated, he knows what it's like. And because of that, he is uniquely qualified to bridge the gap between you and God. The Bible says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is the answer to Job's problem, and he's the answer to yours. He's fully God, but at the same time fully human, and he offers you the chance to come boldly into the throne room of grace and find the help you need. And when you come to that throne, you're going to discover that God has been able to drop his argument against you, not because he didn't have a case, but because of what Jesus accomplished at the cross. God completely understands what it means to be human, what it's like to live in this broken world. He understands disappointment, and he completely understands injustice. It makes him the perfect mediator. It makes him able to bridge the gap between heaven's perfection and, well, you. It kind of reminds me of an old story about Dwight Moody, you know, the famous evangelist from the 1800s. Apparently, he was taking public transit one day when this drunk guy gets on the car and staggers around looking for a seat. And, of course, all the respectable passengers weren't really crazy about having a wino sit down anywhere near them. So they started treating him coldly. As he staggered around, he actually started stepping on their toes. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back because the irritated passengers start demanding, Hey, bus driver, throw this guy off! But as the protests mounted, as the crowd got angry, Dwight Moody got out of his seat and said, No, 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 people. Let this man sit down and be quiet. And at that moment, the drunk turned to Mr. Moody and grabbed him by the hand and said, Oh, thank you. I see you know what it's like to be drunk. Well, Moody probably didn't know what it was like. And I'm absolutely sure Jesus never sinned. But he does know what it's like to be tempted. And he does know what it's like to face disappointment. And he does know what it's like to live here. He understands what you're facing. And as you stagger your way into his presence looking for a seat, he holds out his hand and invites you to sit right down next to him. You know, Job complained that God seemed unapproachable. But in Jesus, we can see he was wrong. In the remaining moments I have with you today, I want you to listen again to Job's complaint. And I'll show you what I mean. Job said, He is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Well, Job was wrong because God really did become a man. Now, Job couldn't have known that thousands of years in advance, but when Jesus came, he showed us what God is like. There's no question our sins have damaged this world, that we have driven a wedge between us and God, but we need to understand that that separation breaks God's heart. And because we couldn't make a move in his direction, he made a move in ours. He became like us, fully human, but still God. And that makes it possible for you to step into his presence. Listen again to Job. 
nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Again, Job is wrong. There is a mediator. There is someone who can grab you with one hand and grab God with the other, and he can bring you together. There is one mediator between God and men, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, and it's the man, Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you something very personal. I know that sometimes life is hard, and when that happens, it's easy to feel like God is a million miles away, but don't you believe it. He's done everything in his power to move closer to you, and he's hoping you'll move closer to him. He really does love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And right now, through Jesus, he's asking you to take a step closer to him. And personally, I think you'd be crazy not to accept the offer. Yeah, sometimes you don't deserve the problems you have. Sometimes you are innocent. At least, that's the way it seems. And you can know God's been watching, and he's promised to set the record straight. But in the meantime, you still need Jesus. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thanks for listening to The Voice of Prophecy. Are you searching for answers to life's most challenging questions? Answers to help you make sense of the chaos in today's world? Answers to the deepest questions in life, like, how can I know that Jesus was real? Was he more than a man, and how do I even know the stories of his time on earth are true? How can I know that the Bible is something that I can believe today? And questions like, if the Bible is true, well, what happens next after this life? Is there really a heaven? And in this world of uncertainty, you might be wondering, is there actually a chance for true happiness in this life? Disappointments like illness and loss of employment can hang like clouds over our lives. Life's daily routine challenges can be overwhelming, and even the things that once made us happy can begin to seem empty. Is it really possible to have a happy, contented life in such an uncertain world? Well, if you're searching for answers to these and other of life's biggest questions, we are here to help. The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at our toll-free number, 888 456 79 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online at our website, BibleStudies.com, or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. At BibleStudies.com, you'll find answers in guides like A Second Chance at Life and Does My Life Really Matter to God? Answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. The major themes of the Bible come to life as we study together guides like When Jesus Comes for You and From Guilty Sinner to Forgiven Saint. And we have lessons just for the kids in your life. Your kids will love KidZone at BibleStudies.com. They'll enjoy the colorfully illustrated stories and interactive lessons in the 14 Kids' Own Bible Guides. And while you're online, be sure to visit us at VOP.com. At VOP.com, you'll find audio archives of this program, the latest ministry news, and resources to help you dig deep into God's Word. Begin your journey to discover answers to life's deepest questions and log on today to BibleStudies.com.